My name is uh, Andrew Lazarus, and I run the real estate practice at the Beryl Consulting Group. And it is my pleasure to introduce our illustrious real estate panel, and I'm going to do it sort of quickly because if I sat here and read the resumes of the people sitting on this stage, I'd probably take up the entire half hour of our speaking time. But um, Guy Geyer, who is the managing partner at FX Collaborative, which is a global um, architecture firm headquartered in New York, and they develop cutting edge architectural solutions. Uh, there are eight partners and 150 people at FX Collaborative. Uh, Liz Kulik and Barry Barovic, who um, are both senior managing directors at the Ankara Consulting Group. Um, they run the real estate and infrastructure practice and Ankara Consulting is a 1,500-person consulting firm headquartered uh, here in New York City. And Oliver Christie um, is someone who's working to help companies utilize AI and embrace uh, the technology. And Oliver is a Google Moonshot winner amongst other honors. And I am now going to change my hat and uh, join the panel. Liz? With that? All right, there may be data, but there's always hardware. Real estate is one of the most interesting industries when it comes to big data because the characteristics around real estate are unique. Number one, everybody uses it, every company uses it. I don't care if you're virtual, you have a server somewhere and it doesn't move. It outlasts its ownership and it potentially becomes part of history. So the concept of data in real estate is truly unique because it, 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 it spans time, it spans ownership, and it spans the history that our buildings and our built environment bring to, bring to our lives. So well, I'd like to talk to the panel today, um, and particularly as we look at Guy and, 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 and Oliver, where is data coming from in the built environment? What does it mean now? Now that we're seeing all of these other industries looking at technology, how is real estate using it in, in, as we start real estate? And I'd love to talk to you about where is it going? And Barry and Andrew, is it in fact a competitive advantage or is this a sea change in real estate and real estate finance? So, Please, Guy, tell us what you can okay. do with data. I know you've built many <laughs> s smart yeah. cities. You're, you're well, yeah, I think uh, what's interesting is that it's really at two scales. So there's the city scale, the smart city, where we're collecting data um, really from the public realm. So it has to do with uh, water, transportation, transit, uh, traffic, um, uh, utility use, all those kinds of big infrastructural scale uh, data sets that are being collected. And then it, it, it is the building, the smart building on the other end of the scale where we're collecting data about um, specific building operations, use of energy in a building, uh, people coming and going, um, lighting, uh, all those sorts of things <clears throat> at the building scale. Mm -hmm. And um, what's I think interesting and hopefully we'll explore a little bit is, is how to connect those two things together. It's not really fully connected right now and to really, I think, leverage the data that we are collecting at the city scale and at the building scale, we're going to have to figure out how to connect the dots. And how can that be used? When you look at that in the two, two ways, one, I'm you know, thinking especially in light of the things that have been going on in the past few weeks, it, how can that, that kind of data, in fact, bring bring value to the community, then right. how can it bring v value to the investors? And what is it between those two? Well, I think at the community, city, uh, regional level, collecting that data can just, um, can allow us to be more efficient in the use of the systems. Mm -hmm. So for instance, London has a, a system called Scoot, which uh, monitors traffic through the city 
and uh, adjust the green light, red light system to uh, allow for traffic flow to move more efficiently. Barcelona has a similar system for their emergency response teams where um, if a fire or a, a ambulance has to get through, they know where that um, emergency service vehicle is going and they can modify the traffic lights to allow it to get through that much quicker. So mm -hmm. having that kind of data on that level, you know, obviously is a service to the community because you're allowing things to move more efficiently um, and, and provide services more effectively. Um, at the building scale, um, we're seeing it through uh, control of systems that allow for heating and cooling and lighting and and uh, glare control. You know, we did a building for the New York Times um, that has an integrated system that um, controls the lights, the shades on the windows, uh, and and controls for day of time and time of year. So this is it's all programmed so that the uh, uh, Daylight is controlled with the blinds, but it's also controlling the lights. That information is collected and adjusted. It's, there's you know, an algorithm that con continuously updates that feedback and adjusts the performance of the building as well as the HVAC systems that are driven off of what the heat loads are that are coming in through the window. So um, it makes it much more efficient as a building operation, reduces expenses, and makes it more comfortable for the occupants as well. That's, real, that's actually very interesting because one of the, statistically one of the reasons tenants leave buildings is the HVAC. That it has nothing to do with location, it's I can't get heating and cooling the way I want it. So that, that actually has a, you know. We could go on a long oh, time forever. just about. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, where do you see this going? So actually I was going to say I was in the New York Times building last week and it's fantastic. It's very, it's a simple change and it's, um, it sounds obvious once you do it. The data, you don't need so much data, you just need the will to do something new. Um, I think we're, all, we're still very early when it comes to smart buildings and smart cities. Uh, there's an often quoted number that 90% of all data is created in the last two years. Well, we're still very, very early in the journey. Um, I think things like um, 5G coming online sort of now, sort of next year, but properly 2020 is going to be interesting. Um, it means we can go from one connected device to a thousand with the same setup. So if we've got a thousand more devices in buildings, on streets, uh, monitoring us in new ways, what are we going to do with the data? We do a good job of things like heating, cooling, um, not a bad job of security actually as well but there's an awful Absolutely. lot more that can be done. Yes. Um, just in New York, if you go into any of the key buildings, uh, Bloomberg being the, the exception, they still ask for ID. They don't know who you are. They don't have a clue who you are. That's a good thing. <laughs> Except you go to Bloomberg, you go once. So uh, you go once, 10 years ago, they've recorded, they've got your photo, they've recorded you. You step up to the front desk, they know who you are, Mr. Christie, go up to the 15th floor, whatever. It's this sort of seamlessness which I think uh, is going to be the thing which will happen next. Mm -hmm. It's sort of solving the obvious problems which each city need. So you mentioned Barcelona, you mentioned London. It's going to be localized. The things that matter to that city mm -hmm. and that culture are the things which will carry forward. Um, but also, I think we should look towards China. China doing amazing things. Um, some a little on the scary side, but they, they have a very connected system. They can push things through because it's government-led much, much faster. And I think it's worth thinking about that as a backdrop. Well, they the also, with regards to that, and the interesting part about China in, in the recent years going over there is certainly that they're not dealing with this massive legacy of historical infrastructure and historical mm -hmm. built environment. So in your opinion, and certainly I'd love to hear from you too, Guy, is this, a, is this sort of the opportunity that, that where, where we're going into to newly formed markets and emerging markets that in fact by, by leveling the playing field, if you will, we're actually going to increase our adaptation of technology, because I know Barry and Andrew 
you both have very strong thoughts about is technology going to be a competitive advantage I think, in this industry? I think actually it's a major problem. The US's big problem right. is uh, we have a lot of legacy systems, a lot of legacy mm -hmm. software, which is easy. We can get rid of that. You can change it up. Legacy <laughs> wait, hardware. wait, 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 time yeah. out. <laughs> That's all. What about the investment? Barry, that was a very yeah. bold statement. It was a good, yeah. it was a good, very bold. Yeah. It, was a, it was a good, it was a good tee up. Because I look at real estate a little bit a little bit differently. We look at it from the financial and the transactional side. And I, I, I would suffice it to say that real estate as an industry has been very, very slow mm -hmm. to adopt real estate technology as an input in the decision-making process. Absolutely. And part of the reason is the foundation of the industry, as Andrew has, has said many times, a broker will go out on the street, mark down an opportunity for a client, take a piece of paper, roll mm. it up, put it, put, it, put it in his pocket, keep it secret, go back to okay. the office, call up the investor, call up the building owner, say, Absolutely. I have a deal for you, and nobody else has it. Mm. So when you take that foundation of non-transparency in the ownership of the data, real estate built on that foundation has been very slow to adopt into the, into the new technologies. Yeah. On the other hand, the financial institutions that we're working with, we're doing a 2,000 acre new city in South Korea, mm -hmm. and we've done them all over, all over the world. The investors demand multiple layers of pixelized digital information in their decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So in the design, in the construction management, in the feasibility side, Data is very real. We as advisors use it all that all the time. In the transactional component of the industry, the data is held very close to the vest. So making data ubiquitous as you move into the transaction realm of the real estate industry, competitive advantage is diminished by have everybody having access to what many would look at a buyer, seller, and mm -hmm. the intermediary in between as privileged information. So Andrew, would that make it a commodity? Um, I don't think it would make it a commodity. Would make trading a commodity? No, but I think just to expand on what Barry said, um, that the underlying data is critical, but people aren't really invested in supporting it. Yeah. And, um, people or, or the, the industry? The industry, okay. and I, I think when I say people, people within the real estate practice world. Yes. And particularly, um, I know Barry and I both look at um, re the transactional side of the business from a financial mm -hmm. and operational and qualitative perspective. And the data needs to be able to support that analysis. And people who are the acquirers of property have been very limited in their ability to support that process. And so, you know, Barry's comment about, you know, there's a huge spread um, in our world where people are running around, you know, writing little notes on pieces of paper and putting them in their pockets. And then you have people like Oliver who are creating artificial intelligence solutions um, for real estate business practices, whether it's management or leasing or consulting or architecture. Um, but I think that there's a big, huge spread. Um, and I, I think data or no data, we need to be able to find the tools for people to be able to support it. Yeah. I, th I think when you look at a real estate transaction, if you dissect it by the professionals and the data that goes into the culmination of a and transaction, the cap stack. It, is very, it is very segregated. And data has become very, very predominant to the law firms. Yep. They have all the legal issues around a building, about a piece, about a piece of property, and they'll have the stack of, of data this high. The title companies have even more data about the history of that company and the potential liabilities that may be facing an owner acquire or investor in a transaction. Mm -hmm. You have the owner and developer who is hiring consultants like us or doing it themselves because they're in the industry who have built up a plethora of 
non-data related gut instincts to make a decision. In Excel. In Excel or, how, or in Excel, how, however they're modeling it. And then you have what is really important in the capital stack is who is really owning the real estate. And, and, and you really have to dissect that and understand how the data plays in that stack. So you have those, those four or five professionals and you have the architects and you have the engineers all having a tremendous amount of data trying to culminate into a, into a financial decision that will result in a smart building, well engineered, that will yield a successful return for the investors going forward. But the capital stack, when you dissect in a real estate deal, if you do a GP, LP split on the debt, on, on, on the debt, debt and equity, the financial institutions are really providing 80% of the leverage finance into that stack. So when you look at it in a syndicated model, a GP will come in with his five, he'll bring in the syndicate the deal, push it down. So the real driver behind the financial numbers and performance are the financial institutions or the investors into, into that deal. Yes. That translates into what Guy and Oliver were saying, then they expect performance of the asset. Mm. And that's where the real estate data rainbow has really focused. It hasn't been able to remove the financial elements, right. the gut of the or owner, the experience. and the experience in the market, because it's still local. And I, you know, having done this for 43 years, I still find it very difficult to tell a real estate entrepreneur or a real estate investor developer that I know more about real estate than he does. Well, it just we doesn't work out. That. It just, just doesn't work that way. But we're also seeing huge pressure from corporations, and I think this is where the opportunity, and Guy, as, as you're talking about it, and, and Oliver too, those are, are areas where data is already being consumed. It's not the competitive advantage that it is in real estate. So I'm curious to see how you feel about that. Well, I think on, on the corporate real estate side, um, you know, corporations with large real estate holdings right. are very interested in this, and it's, and and so they are collecting data, uh, or interested in finding ways to collect the data, so that they can leverage their assets the most effectively um, across all of their property holdings. Right. Um, it's a very different thing for an individual building owner or whatever, but but for developers who own numerous properties and for corporations who also own uh, corporate facilities, getting this kind of data is very important because they want to maximize their utilization and, and, and their return on investment as well. So uh, these are all very important. And I, I just wanted to kind of um, add on a little bit because we talk about the segregation of uh, the real estate industry. And you know we've seen it in architecture and engineering and construction for many years. You know, up until recently, we basically built the same way as we did in the Renaissance. You designed a building, <laughs> you drew some, you did drew some drawings, you handed it to a builder, and they built it, and hopefully it had some resemblance to and what you drew. And the builder would hire <laughs> the builder would hire us to try and find the money. <laughs> right. And at the end of the project, you'd get an as set of as-built drawings that you'd hand to the owner and say, "Have a nice day." The, can I interrupt and, you there? Yeah. Because this is actually a break in the value chain. Yeah. That owner, when he sells that building in three years, because that's when his fund expires, or you know, that's when he needs to, to make his transaction. Those drawings stayed with the original owner. Well, hopefully, because I can't tell you how many times we go in to do a project in a building. Second time and around. And we say, can we have right? the drawings? And everybody says, well, Every, I don't know where no they are. <laughs> so, so, so the, 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 but, the but the important thing that's changing now is that the, the, it's, it's really drawings are seen as data, not hard lines. Absolutely. And so um, we start to design buildings using 3D uh, uh, computational design and building information management so that at the end of the day, when we hand over documents, it's not really, they are documents in a sense, but they are a data set yeah. that the, that the um, contractor then uses to purchase and fabricate, sometimes offsite, um, uh, components of the building, build the building, and then when it's done, uh, the drawings are updated in real time by the contractors and the architects and the engineers, and the owner gets a set of updated, uh, an updated building model, which is again just a set of data that they can use to then operate 
the building into the future. Right. And, and it's not this kind of static system of handing things to each other. And that's real data. I mean, that is what in yeah. this business we would call pure, because certainly the financial da data is subject to interpretation. But that, Oliver, how, does, how do those two data sets mix? Because this is defensible data. And Barry, I know you'll have something to say about this, and Andrew as well. But how do you, how do you move artificial intelligence and all of the predictive value from hard data to the less tangible financial and certainly less ability to be normalized? You're absolutely right. It is less tangible. It is less binary. Yeah. That's both the challenge. Um, it's a very exciting challenge. It really is. But there's no rule book for this. Um, so, I mean, we, we're doing two projects at the moment. One is um, designing a future-based hospital, which uh, it knows roughly what you, you're coming in for mm -hmm. as you are in the, in the ambulance on the way. It knows what future trends are in terms of healthcare. Um, and it is a lot more flexible. So that's uh, for the US. But out of uh, Asia, we're also designing an airport which will help to basically eliminate jet lag. When you say designing an airport, what does that mean? So it's very much a spec project. People haven't said, hey, we need a new airport. So no feasibility Not yet. yet. Okay. But it's more, what are the ideas around if you're designing a very large piece of architecture gotcha. and you've got AI and data at the core, what would you build? Well, for an airport, it's not just let's cram more shops in there. What's the purpose of your journey? Sure. How can you make it much better? Jet lag being one thing that mm -hmm. really knocks us Absolutely. out. The interesting thing is we've got the medical research. We've got the data. We're not changing our, um, our buildings to reflect that yet. So what, does that, what do these buildings look like? When will, they, can they, when will they come and can they be financed? Is this the kind of, of, of future that Andrew, Andrew and Barry, is this the kind of future that we can bring to institutions and actually see it become financed? Well, I, I, think, I think there's, you have to look at, 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 at a new city or building or a piece of property for, as, 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 a, as a pure investment vehicle for the moment for the discussion. The current buyer is buying at current, what he perceives to be current value. Absolutely. Where, where he up. believes he's going to realize a future value mm. sometime in the future, whether it's through a fund that expires in five to seven, whether it's through a syndication where all the, all the GPs and the LPs have agreed we want out. They're expecting a future value to be a multiple of current value asset purchase, right? Fundamental of real estate. You buy a house and, if, you know, somebody once told me, if you ever bought a home, you're in the real estate business, right? So you buy a house, you hopefully it goes up in value. What, what is really interesting about predictive analysis and AI in that model is the cyclical nature of the real estate industry. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, and just to pick up on what Barry was saying, um, I think that I'd like to see the data take us into the future where, you know, I'm looking at a property on 45th Street and Madison Avenue, and the data says, hey, Andrew, you don't want to be buying the property on 45th Street and Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. The demographics are bad. The interest rates are bad. The history is all wrong. The, you know, the, the data set is taking me and then telling me that I shouldn't be buying property in New York at all, that maybe I should be buying it in Puerto Rico, where there are huge tax advantages, or I've, I should I've be- heard, or, I've heard that's true. Right, or, <laughs> or I should be buying it in you know, Connecticut, or in St. Louis, or Austin, or whatever the marketplace is, that the data is gonna take me to, to be able to maximize the asset value uh, of the investment. Yeah. And really, that's what real estate is all about. Yeah, but I, I think, around, agreed, 100%, but I think around that, you have to build the parentheses of the cyclical nature of the industry. You know, I don't know how many and times... And the appetite Liz, of the fund, how, how the, many times the over the past over the past two years 
how many people have come up to us, large institutions as well as private investors, and say, "Do you think we're at the bottom? Of, do you think we're at the top of the cycle?" Every right? day. And, 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 and it gets back to the earlier, earlier panel of how do, you, how do you advise somebody on predictive analysis of, 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 of where you are. The difference, the difference is you can measure performance of a company over time, predict where they're going, right. look at what they're doing in their, in their engineering, research, and design. Real estate, as Andrew just pointed out, is very localized. All right, so a general cycle that we went through, and look, I've lived through from the RTC days forward. Mm -hmm. The cycle that we last went through was an impairment of the underwriting. Right. It didn't affect the actual asset performance. The assets were still performing, the underwriting and financial superstructure was not. Right. All right, so when you get to a cycle, you not only have to look at the temporal time, the local real estate issues, geography, and all that could be pixelized, mm -hmm. but you have to understand where the impairment may occur and how it may occur. Mm -hmm. And the question I've always had, how do you predict that? We had, a, in the last talk, uh, a mention of where things are going to head in the next five years in terms of data. That it'll be man plus machine plus data. And I think for real estate, that's not where we are at the moment, but that's where we're heading. I think the, the man, or woman in this case, is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. If you ignore that, if you ignore the, the local knowledge, the knowledge of market cycle and so on, you, it's not gonna work. This isn't technology driven, but we should really be, I, I'm surprised things aren't being adapted much faster. Will technology actually, what you're really saying is that the experience in the people of, of real estate is, is what is the competitive advantage. You can surround that with data, and, but the, the, it is the experience, and it is the, those certain characteristics, like an asset, isn't going to be held like a home. It's going to sell in three to five years. It's going to be refinanced. An owner only owns this much of it, really, when you I think mean, about I it. I think the, the, should we say, the rules of the game. Exactly Are they going to change? I don't think they will. Because of regulatory and compliance yeah. issues. I don't think they will. But I think there's um, huge moves happening from some very large companies out of China. We've heard about which what SoftBank are gonna, is doing. Yeah, which are going to start disrupting here. And I'm having conversations with some of these organizations and they don't care about your legacy systems or legacy ways of doing it. <laughs> They're not going to ask forgiveness. I won't no. sell. There's Ooh. the ultimate. I don't have to sell. You don't have to so, sell, but... The right price. Yeah. But is that, is that in fact going to be... You know, I understand in the early days you can certainly create that competitive advantage in pricing and, and knowledge collection, but it really is data turning into knowledge. So. And, and the panel before us said, you know, as soon as that data becomes so present in, in the system, that advantage goes away. So, in fact, it ends up decreasing prices, and it will, will, in fact, have a material effect on the downturn of the real estate industry, perhaps. Is that something you and, you, you're seeing or you're seeing? Yeah, I, I, you know, you and Andrew have heard this for 20 years now from me. I don't believe there's value in data in the real estate industry. Hmm. I, I have believe, heard that for 20 years. <laughs> I, belie I believe there is value in information that is transposed from the data to make a decision. I agree with you, absolutely. Right. All right, and that's right. a fundamental difference. Would you agree with that guy too? Yeah, I do, and I, but I, and I kind of you look at analogies you know, in other areas like uh, uh, you know, sports and, uh, you know, money ball, right? So, so there's a lot of data that, that they crunch and they understand what everybody's individual batting average is against any individual pitcher and they understand that that pitcher is likely to throw this kind of pitcher, that exactly. kind of pitch against this batter in this circumstance. And they've got it all kind of, yeah, the data that. sets are all there. But when it comes down to a decision, the manager sits there and yeah. says, I don't okay. care any about so, anything about that. I'm going to put this guy in right, right now. And that, and that and, gets the and that's the kind nature. of stuff. That's right. It's that's a, the fundamental right. nature of the real estate industry. Right. Somebody is collecting 
synthesizing, evaluating all that data, turning it into what they believe is information for their decision-making process. But the data isn't making the decision, it's the human element in the transaction that is interpreting that data going forward. And pricing so, it. And pricing accordingly. So you're saying no one wants to be Brad Pitt? Nobody no. wants what? Say it be one Brad more. Pitt. No one wants to be Brad no, Pitt. Moneyball. <laughs> uh, we worked for the guys at Ernst. When I ran Ernst & Young, money, they were our client. You know, we did Moneyball. Andrew, and you have exactly something to right. say All about that. In the world to make you a winner. Yes, yeah. yeah, so the answer is that you know, there hasn't been one person that I've listened to um, on these panels over the last two days that hasn't said that there has to be some kind of human element to the data, that somebody needs to understand it and process it. And I don't think that there's any disagreement from any professional uh, on that comment. Um, the other thing is that, you know, in sports, if you go one for three, you get into the Hall of Fame. In real estate, if you go one for three, uh, you go bankrupt. You're only as good as your latest <laughs> so deal. It's right. It's not, um, you know, I think that there is a data solution. There's data out there for every solution. It's how um, you analyze it and assess it and use it to your benefit that's going to make the difference. I think you're right. One, we've got five minutes here, and one quick thing. How do you pay for it? How is this getting done? Because we all know that the real estate and built environment, there is more data than you can, it's a happy place. But how are you going to get this stuff done? I imagine we would have different opinions clear, clearly on that. Because I would, I would argue, going back to the mid-'80s, when lighting systems first became in vogue, that you could really <laughs> enhance. I had Tishman Spire, I had Brookfield, I had every major developer in New York saying, hey, okay, we could bring you value in your asset by enhancing this system and it's really, it's really environmentally sensitive and it's the, it's the right way to do it. Every one of them said to me, what does it do to my bottom line? Is it gonna cost me money on a CapEx and how am I going to amortize that over my operating leases going forward? And can I pass it through to the tenant? Exactly. All right? So without all the legislation around green buildings and all, all that, without the financial underwriting to the developer, the owner, the investor, the funds, they're not so quick to enhance a building unless they understand financial benefits from it. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you one last question as we close this panel. What would your advice be to a venture capitalist who is invest, trying to invest in real estate, technology, prop tech, AI, any of it? Um, my, How much? Bet the farm? Yeah, I would go heavily into um, AI investment in real estate. I think that there's a huge future for it. I think that, that as Guy pointed out, it's an institutional start, but mm -hmm. I think that it's more of a transformational process. So as people begin to move forward, um, the technology understanding of our children is far greater than ours, and they will embrace it true. in a way that, our, that, that we and our parents do not. So you're saying so when... So I think that as we move forward, um, it will become broader and more highly accepted and easier to um, put into the process. Excellent. Barry? Yeah, I'll differ from Andrew, which is not <laughs> unusual. Uh, I agree with all what he said about information and the investment. But if you want to be in the real estate industry, you have to be in the real estate industry and own the assets. Right. Or the financing or the underwriting to it. All right, I once was the CEO of a company that was purchased by a fund who thought they could run a professional services firm and be in the real estate industry. Mm. And my first answer was, you can't be in the real estate industry unless you own real estate. True, true. Right, so with all, all the data around it, I think in, it will enhance that opportunity to invest. But you, if, you're going to be in the, if you want to be in the industry, you got to be in the dirt. Mm. 
Oliver? Again, a slightly different answer, and I actually like both of these answers. I think they're, they're very, very strong answers. Um, I already advise uh, hedge funds and other people on VC. technologies. On VC, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so I look at the fundamentals of what the technology is actually doing, both on the, shall we say, the AI, deep learning, ML side. But really, what's it trying to solve for? What is the ROI that you're actually looking for? You need to solve for something, and you need to do it well. Um, there's a couple of companies I'm involved in at the moment which are building out uh, what's going to be a Bloomberg for real estate. Another one which is doing uh, legal compliance with documents. Um, they're both early, but they're both very much for real estate, but they're very solving a narrow problem. You can't do everything. It's, it's impossible at the moment. Guy, to wrap up. Oh, so, us. since I have the last word, I'll say hire a great architect. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, I, and, and I'm saying that uh, jokingly, but at the same time. Do you, I and we I think that, to have one. Well, yeah, but, 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 and there are others, but not many. Um, anyway, uh, the point is that um, I think, you know, firms, architectural firms uh, who kind of get the full breadth of this, right, that, that are, are not just design firms and looking to create a monument, but but firms that understand the full breadth of the process and how to integrate um, smart technologies into the buildings and tie them into the cities and make, you know, build the, the highest possible value Absolutely. for an investor. Very good. Any questions? Vidak? No, Scott. Oh, Scott! Hello. Oh. <laughs> no questions from you. Yeah, sure. So I, I think that that's very prevalent in New York City. Uh, I think it's less prevalent as you get around the country, that people tend to look at real estate deals, yes, from a relationship point of view, but I think that they, when it comes down to looking at financial and operational and qualitative issues, that people still assess the acquisition based on the fundamentals. You know, relationships or no relationships. I agree. Yeah, I, you know, real estate is interesting. It's real estate is a buy, investing in real estate, buying real estate is a binary decision. It's yes or no. You know, it's not where you could buy a stock, trend it for a while, see if it goes up and down, maybe buy more, et cetera. If you're if you're buying a building in New York, you're buying an asset Absolutely. anywhere in the yeah. world, somewhere in a personal relationship supported by data. It's a binary decision. Yes, I'm going to do it or no, I'm not going to do it, all right? And you have to have the, it's like a stock trade. You have to have the seller realizing that he's doing well on the, on the sell and the buyer is doing well on the buy. Okay. But it's a yes or no decision every time. I don't know if that's true anymore. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But I it's also I, when I the know if that's really true anymore. But it's also when the analysis do, is done. I mean, there are there are times when somebody will decide I want to buy a building at 45th and Madison, mm -hmm. and I'm going to identify that property, and then I'm going to run the analytics and see if it makes sense, or you run a set of data and find out that hmm might be a good idea to buy a building on the corner of 45th and Madison. I'm going to go see what you know, as possible. So it's kind of where the analytics is applied and how you use it. 
And then the comparative. You might look at that analytic for 45th and say, well, it actually makes sense in Peoria. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think the relationship will change. I think, especially for New York, New York is a relationship city. I don't think that will change. But here's the thing. If you're trying to sell me a building and you give me a, a printout, a five-page printout, seriously, now? Or you give me full data, you give me projections, you give me a really good reason why this is the thing to buy. That extra data backs up your sale. It doesn't change the relationship one bit, but it makes a sale much easier. And I think the idea that we're still printing out documents is a type of craziness. So the, what really came in my head, and then we'll, we'll close for sure, was why would I give you access to all my data if I don't have a binding letter of intent? You wouldn't directly is the answer. Um, work, <laughs> working with some, so the answer is you wouldn't. You wouldn't. I know. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't. But um, if you can give up that to a third party, you have a safe harbor, you don't have, you know that data and information isn't gonna go onto the market in any form. That would be the big concern. Um, that's what's being built now. There's a couple of companies, one out of the Netherlands, which you're going to hear yeah. about soon, which solves for exactly this problem. Because yeah. no one wants to give up your da their data. No, that's true. And particularly in this business, it is competitive advantage. Well, we're wrapping up. We could clearly go on for days. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs>